Great. Yeah, so like I said, I'm Tim Stikatovich from UW-Madison. Uh, the, the talk I'll be talking or giving now is called Key Concepts in Radiation Dose Management in Computed Tomography. Here are my conflicts of interest. We work with several CT vendors at our institution. I don't receive any personal income from any CT uh, vendor. All right, so key concepts in radiation dose. So first, before we talk about maybe what it does to the human um, body, let's talk about what it does to image quality, because it's, I think, really key to understand what happens if we give a lot of it, right? So here I'm showing for the same, same size phantom that as the amount of radiation dose, in this case, I have a surrogate for it here at the bottom, the amount of tube current or MAS that's being delivered to the image goes up from 10 to 20 to 70 to 280. I'm measuring the noise in the image. That's what this uh, these red numbers represent. It's going from 30 to 23 to 12 to 6. It's a fundamental relationship that as the radiation dose goes up, our image noise goes down. Now we can parameterize this or put an equation to describe this behavior, and that's what I have right here. But I think a simple way to think about this is that if we want it to uh, drop our noise by a factor of two, we need to increase our dose by a factor of four. So this is CT 101. It's been known since before I was born um, that this fundamental relationship exists. This is due to the way we reconstruct the images in computed tomography. And I think it's an important thing to understand because we're going to have more than factors of two differences in image noise between our screening protocols and our routine protocols and then up to our higher dose, uh, high image quality needs like a spine type protocol or like a cancer follow cancer follow up protocol. So we should be expecting to be modulating our dose by many hundreds of percent for the same patient size like I showed on that last uh, slide. Easiest example for you to bring this home to your own shop to understand that, go to PAX, look up a PET attenuation correction scan, look up a cancer follow-up scan. Uh, if the same patient has, you know, uh, in that in their jacket, and you'll see what I'm talking about, a very big difference in MAS and in the noise in the images. At the same time, if we keep the dose uh, fixed and don't don't change that at all and just look at noise varying across different size patients, like I have shown here in this cool phantom that lets me do that because it changes uh, size. Uh, they call this the Mercury Phantom because it resembles uh, the Mercury uh, spaceship, right? We can see that the noise is going up as the water equivalent diameter or a surrogate for the patient size is going up. So we're going to see this clinically, right? If you've got, a, say, a cardiac, this is common cardiac gated protocol in your clinic that uses the same MA every time, right, in a very fast rotation time, maybe you're frustrated as a cardiovascular imager because all the big patient's images are really noisy, and this is why, because the noise is really increases quite quickly with a constant technique with patient size. You can see here in this phantom, we're getting from around like six ounce per unit up to around uh, 15 uh, ounce per unit. So more than more than doubling just because of size there. So that's actually one of my CE questions that if you keep your dose fixed and increase patient size, the noise will go up. All right, so another key concept to know, right? That's how, that's how radiation dose affects the images, right? And maybe a, a good way or a bad way, depending on how you think about it from what I just described. But what else does it do uh, outside of, of the image quality, right? If we use way too much radiation, right, and do something grossly negligent with our CT scanner, like happened to a bunch of these folks here, unfortunately, uh, and deliver way too much radiation dose, we can cause problems, tissue effects. So these patients all suffered some skin reddening and hair loss because someone set up a perfusion protocol that basically was delivering diagnostic quality images for every time point instead of vastly lower dose images for all of those perfusion time points. So that's that's what happened here. That's a big no-no. And that can we can uh, use our CT scanner if we if we use it in that grossly uh, inappropriate way to 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 do what you can see here. So we have to do a lot of scanning though, right? Because typically we're used to throwing around numbers and computed tomography that we call, you know, MGY, milligray. 
that's a thousand times smaller than what we need to um, do to actually cause any of these deterministic or tissue effects that you can see here, like skin reddening or hair loss. These are just some of the thresholds that you need to hit to cause problems, right? These are the things that people in radiation oncology worry about. We shouldn't really be worrying about these in computed tomography uh, on a routine basis, like I said, unless you have gross negligence. This poor little kiddo, I think the technologist, they, the images weren't popping up right, so they just kept repeating the scan because they thought that was going to fix it. You know, gross uh, negligence and competence on the part of the operator there to cause something like that. This was a little different, just the way that all that the perfusion stuff happened with the way the pro protocols were programmed in. So this is another one of my CE questions. We'll get these out of the way uh, early. So um, go back to lunch, maybe. Um, anyway, just kidding. So the tissue effects here, deterministic effects from high doses of radiation in CT are not uh, normal and they require gross negligence and they could result in skin uh, burns and in hair loss. All right. So it's also important now to talk, okay, so those were grossly uh, huge doses of radiation that got delivered, but like what happens for a typical patient, right, that comes through our clinic? Well, our typical doses that we're delivering our patients um, are way lower than what's caused to burn someone or take their hair off. And basically they're around back, the average background, few millisieverts that you'd get just being a human being on the surface of the planet, um, up to a few times that. That's the typical amount of irradiation dose that we'd be delivering for a single scan. Now we can for sure deliver more than that on some complicated multi-phase protocols or a trauma patient that gets that pan, you know, a, a routine head, a C-spine, a trauma chest, a multi-phase abdomen and a runoff or something. You know, we, there are, we can deliver uh, much more than that, but that's, that's kind of the, um, the area we are for most um, kind of one-off type uh, patients that come in. It's much lower than the places where we have some epidemiological evidence for carcinogenic risks, you know, cancer causing risks from computed tomography. So I think it's just really important to keep that in mind, right? Where we're operating in a typical one-off patient, it's much lower than where we think we might be causing harm. So even though we're operating really at that really low threshold, right, we still are worrying and we're still trying to keep that as low as possible because this isn't scientific fact whether we're going to be causing cancer or not. This is still a hotly debated and hotly researched area of research in radiology and in medicine, right? So we do our best to keep it as low as possible. And one of the things we do there is making sure we understand how much radiation dose we're delivering for different indications and as a function of size. By now in this conference or this symposium, you probably, you know, you, you understand that. Um, here I'm just showing, uh, this is data from the uh, a summary of data from the American College of Radiology's Dose Index Registry, where they've broken this down by size and by indication. All right, so let's keep going. All right, so I think it's important to note, though, when, when it comes to these lower doses, um, this is a hotly de debated area, and um, my talk is going to be sprinkled with my understanding of this, and I think I'm going to be kind of um, maybe differing from some other folks in the field, but here's kind of a summary of where, you know, where, where I'm at. And that is the, if you look up the APM policy statement uh, on, on radiation dose, they say, quote, epidemiological evidence supporting increased cancer incidence or mortality from radiation doses below 100 millisieverts is inconclusive. Uh, furthermore, if you look at the BR7 report, um, they make it clear that there's not a consensus in the valid validity of summing CT dose in vitro and in vivo data are needed for delivery of low doses over several weeks or months at very low doses or with fractional exposures and the cumulative effect of multiple low doses less than 10 milligray delivered over extended periods has to be explored um, further. So we really are operating in the space where we don't, we're not exactly sure if there's harm being caused, but we're trying to be as safe as possible. All right, but that doesn't stop um, some folks from um, saying, hey, well, what if like we were causing harm at these really low doses? So if you're new to the field of radiology, this is probably one of like the seminal papers um, that you need to understand when it comes to some of the negatives of the tests that we administer. This is this so-called like Brenner and Hall paper where they went through and looked at 
what fraction of cancer incidences uh, in the United States could be being caused by medical imaging or computed tomography. And they came up with uh, some number estimates there. So between that and some of these other skin uh, hair loss issues, I think we're real drivers in our community where if you look at historic rates of publications on CT dose reduction, they really kind of skyrocketed around right after the time of that Brenner and Hall paper and some of these hair loss uh, issues. You know, we had the hair loss issues that said, yeah, there is a problem. And you had uh, folks, you know, doing some back of the envelope math saying like, if, if these low doses could be harmful, this is the magnitude of the problem. So I think these were good things that really did help a lot of the quality and safety uh, issues and efforts, um, efforts rather that we, that we see today. We probably wouldn't be here today without that paper and some of, unfortunately, some of the issues with that hair loss. All right, so let's move forward. Okay, so confusing terminology, right? So this is key concepts. This is the title here. So I wanna help us kind of uh, wade through some of the possible uh, sources of confusion that we can have here. So one of them is it's, it's not trivial to just talk about dose and the magnitude of dose in computed tomography. And the reason is, is because there's a lot of different ways to talk about it that are that are formal, formal ways to talk about it that use different metrics for quantifying the amount of dose that we deliver from the x-ray machine that we actually have absorbed into the patient or that maybe actually can cause some carcinogenic uh, risk to that patient. These are all different units. So let's just kind of, so what I did here is I typed CT dose into you know, radiology's journal, and we'll just look at some of the papers and some of the vastly different ways people talk about dose, right? So one popular way people will talk about dose is by using the dose length product, right? That stands for, we commonly just refer to this as the DLP. Um, that has units of milligray times centimeters. It's basically you take how much of the patient you scanned in the Z direction and multiply it by the average dose that you deposited to that patient over that scan range. It's kind of like a, an estimate for the total energy inside the patient. We might just talk about the scanner output itself, right? How many milligray um, did the scanner deliver, right? So it actually has nothing to do with how much dose the actual patient got. It's more like how much radiation output did the machine itself administer for a particular scan. We could talk about dose rates. So not so much about what the total dose is, but just the machine, uh, depending on what MA value uh, we're gonna run that scanner at, it'll have different amounts of dose per unit time that get deposited. So here, this could be important if you're doing some sort of CT fluoroscopy for a biopsy uh, or an ablation, a drainage, uh, you know, you, you name any, anything we do in the interventional setting. We also might just talk about some of the technical parameters used to set up the dose delivery. So we have KV, we have AS, we have MA. Here I'm, I'm circling this studies talking about the, the MAS um, and then also quantifying dose using effective dose in millisieverts. So even when you, um, when you go and look at from what the ACR uh, dose index registry, I, I, I spoke about this report earlier. Here's another table from that same report. They've got multiple different ways to discuss the radiation dose from the scanner. These are probably some of the most conventional and um, common ones that I have here on this slide now, CTDI vol. That's the average dose that the patient's getting uh, over, um, or excuse me, that's the average dose that a piece of plastic of a similar um, size to an average size patient is getting. The size specific dose estimate is that number corrected to a variable patient size. And then the DLP, like I said earlier, is just like the total energy imparted to um, maybe an average size patient, if you will. We're not gonna go into like tons of details and driving um, all of these quantities. I think my, my goal for this intro section here was just to point out that there's a lot of different uh, terminologies and that we, we see that in these reports here where we, we don't just report one number, even the ACR is actually giving us multiple different numbers. Um, I think 
th th this is the, the number here that we usually are going to use when we're talking about radiation risk for cancer causing um, issues with CT. And that's going to be the effective dose. And the units of that are going to be in uh, millisieverts. All right. So earlier when I talked about some of the tissue effects, and there you'll usually see people talking about dose limits in, in gray, the unit gray or the uh, absorbed dose. And we also have here, um, I, didn't, I didn't talk about it, but we, we, we have the skin reddening and the hair loss, but also uh, cataract formation, which can be an issue with computer tomography if some of those repeated uh, negligent and inappropriate scans are happening over the orbits. All right, so with all that discussion about radiation dose, I think it's important that we like say, okay, well, what are the numbers do I need to know? Because that was a lot of different types of units and so forth. So I think the important things that you need to know, if you want to compare, say, your dose for a given protocol to a colleague down the street, um, I think in terms of the CTD eyeball, the DLP, or maybe the SSD, if, they're, if they have a radiation uh, dose monitoring system, that's going to output that. I personally, I didn't talk about organ doses. Some of these dose monitoring tools are outputting organ doses. Like that's pretty, I don't know. To, to personally, I think that's kind of an academic thing to do. I, I don't actually know what I would do if some of my colleagues are like, what's your pancreas dose or liver, you know, dose or lung dose or breast dose, even, you know, and it's just like, uh, and what am I really going to do with that? Even if I knew mine uh, to tweak my protocol. I don't find a lot of value in that. I'd be happy we could talk about that at the end of my talk. Um, I advise not to think in terms of MA, MAS, or effective MAS. That doesn't really translate well. If everyone in the world had the exact same scanner, make, and model, awesome. We could talk in terms of MAS, effective MAS, but we don't. So these are not all made equal. If two different CT scanners um, have two different amounts of beam filtration, the same effect of MAS is not going to give you the same radiation dose, right? If two different CT scanners have two different bore sizes, which is very common, even if they have the same filtration at the same effect of MAS, they're not going to give the same dose because one of the x-ray tubes further away from the patient than the other one. Um, so yeah, so CTD eyeball and DLP and, and SST are really the important ones when we're within the world of CT, talking to colleagues about CT. When you want to compare to other modalities there, we really want to use millisieverts or our effective dose because that's going to take into account how much, uh, what, sorry, what body region that we're actually scanning and then how much individual organs are getting irradiated and sum that all up for us so we don't need to worry about what organ doses are uh, and where, what, what body part we're scanning. It's just putting it the output into one clean number for us in uh, millisieverts. All right, so this is actually another... Uh, one of my, I think my last CE question for this one, that is effective dose in millisieverts is the best uh, metric uh, for comparing CT dose across modalities. All right. So now uh, we've gotten some of the um, like kind of preliminaries out of the way. I want to get into some more like more practical things. So the first kind of practical thing I want to talk about because it's becoming more and more common is talking uh, advising our, our uh, cl referring clinicians, technologists, other colleagues, whether they're physicists, radiologists, et cetera, about if we have to worry about a patient getting a lot of scans over their lifetime. This literally just came up in my clinic uh, yesterday on one of our human subject uh, research studies. So it's something that's more and more common that we're going to hear about. So I thought we should treat it here. So the first is kind of this interesting uh, paper and survey that the authors did where they looked at how radiation exposure histories influence physician imaging decisions. So this was a multi-center survey. So they kind of posed it like this. They said, hey, you've got this 35-year-old man with non-specific abdominal pain, and uh, the, they, got, they got recommended a standard uh, CT scan. But then right before um, you're about to hang up with this phone call where you're recommending that CT scan, you learned that the patient had had 15 prior CT scans and they got all this extra radiation dose. And they said, okay, are you still going to recommend that CT scan? So the authors looked at this and they said, yeah, uh, on every, most of the uh, participants said, yeah, we still would, but about a quarter of them said no. And of the ones who said no, the, in the knowledge of that dose history was definitely influencing them as to 
not wanting to get that future CT scan. So we know already, like this is definitely something that is a factor uh, in protocoling um, and appropriateness, appropriateness criteria for different exams that's going on in inside physicians' heads today. So I think it's just important that we have like some understanding of some of the facts here related to cumulative dose, right? Number one, it's like, it's really easy to calculate. You just sum up effective doses in a patient's history. So most, any dose monitoring solution that I, that's commercially available today can easily calculate effective dose and running a sum over time is a very easy computational task uh, to do. But I think we have to be aware that I'm not aware of any studies that have performed relating that integration period with any kind of stochastic cancer effects. In other words, do we have some awesome big data set where we can say, okay, let's sum for the last one year, the last two years, maybe the last three weeks or the last 10 years, and then get some cumulative effective dose and compare that to risk. I don't think, you know, the field, we don't have an answer to that question. And the second fact I think here we need to understand is that denying CT based on high cumulative effective dose means we are weighing the current need for CT lower than any kind of future potential cancer risks. I don't think we have to date any studies performed or guidance given from anyone advocating CED being used in the clinic on any kind of age or indication-based limits. In other words, you're probably a different story if you're already 90 years old and you're in some kind of traumatic life situation, get the CT versus maybe if you're a five-year-old and uh, you've got some abdominal pain and an ultrasound maybe would also be appropriate. That, that There's probably a different answer for each one of those two different patients given their indications and their age, but we don't have clear guidance on what to do in those kinds of situations. So I think too, we have to be aware that repeat customers in our clinic, unfortunately they're like likely to die within a few years. So I'm gonna show you some studies that have also that have quantified and looked at this. So I think using CED to keep them from getting a CT, you know, isn't supported by the literature because of that. So. First study we'll look at here is by uh, Zondervan. This was over a decade ago now. They were one of their conclusions was that among young adults undergoing body CT, the risk of death from underlying morbidity is more than an order of magnitude greater than the death from the long-term radiation cancer. So you kind of have this big table of all these patients they looked at consisting of some real data and some theoretical data, right, from the um, linear no threshold model on cancer risk. You can see that the numbers in the real data column, right, are much bigger than the numbers in the far right column. So they kind of, at the end of the day, concluded that in this context, there, there was a very small, maybe 0.1% death risk attributable to radiation uh, from CT scanning when they say it's not negligible, but it's very tiny uh, in comparison to what the patients, their underlying morbidity had. So, you know, moreover, for the radiologist advising a patient or referring physician about radiation, Concerns our results to find the patient's underlying medical morbidity rather than CT-induced cancer as the dominant factor driving a potentially uh, adverse outcome. All right, one second. I just want to make sure we're still good on time here. Okay. All right, so uh, here's another study uh, from Brenner where it's kind of along the same theme, like I'm saying, like we've got to have, understand the patient's peculiar or particular circumstances of their age and indication, right? So one of their conclusions was imaging justification and optimization criteria for patients with substantially reduced life expectancy should not necessarily be the same as for those with normal life expectancies, right? We've got to have answers to these questions. There's got to be different thresholds if we're going to use CED for these different patients. Um, or we can't really leave it up to individual physicians to kind of have an easy access to a CED, cumulative effective dose number, without guidance on what to do in these situations. So um, some kind of conclusions, because this is kind of, this concept of cumulative effective dose is nothing, nothing new, right? We, the radiology paper, Zondervan, was published over a decade ago, but it's re recently resurfaced with a lot of um, research interest on this. And I think I think we have to be clear that there's not been studies linking this to increase in cancer risk, and there's no consensus over these time periods which we can summit. And the almost you know ubiquitous use of informatics solutions to track and monitor CT dose metrics makes in implementing these CT CED alarms really easy. Really, it's it's trivial honestly, without science to back up the length of summing 
or the CED values for specific patient indication, age ranges, clinical scenarios, et cetera. I fear, you know, how, how those alarms would be used in the, in the real world. So I think we really need, the proponents really need to give clear guidance on, you know, for what patients does this small 1% maybe increase over the baseline risk of cancer, which is also already double digit, you know, motivate refusing CT cancer in the future, for example, like in the setting of trauma. That's the, the danger here I worry about. So I think the evidence to date demonstrates there's definitely these theoretical risks of cancer incidents and cancer deaths that are order or magnitude smaller than our patient's underlying morbidity. Um, and I don't think we should let these past radiation exposures impact our decisions to order present or future studies. And I think the, the advocates of CED don't have the kind of data to guide us on how or when to apply CED in the clinic. So uh, kind of everything I just said on that last slide is also distilled in this policy statement from the AAPM, which I helped write, that was also adopted by the ACR and the Health Physics Society. All right. I see I'm getting a few questions. This is great. So I will make sure we end. I think this is supposed to go to 10 after. That's uh, 45 minutes. So, so, we, so we can get to those. Um, great. Thanks. All right. So let's keep going. So now we'll stop talking about CED and we'll talk about some other, uh, what I think are key things about radiation dose that we're going to see in the clinic, right? We're going to see the CED stuff in the clinic. Um, and I think this is something we're also going to deal with. I spoke yesterday about how to adapt patient um, CT dose to as a function of patient size. And I was asked to also cover pregnancy there. And on my last slide, I said, don't do it. You shouldn't be changing your CT protocols to uh, lower doses, aka make the images bad when it comes to pregnancy, right? People do that kind of thing, right? I don't understand why, because you know, if you're starting with a protocol that's already dose optimized, doing anything to, to, to lower the dose is then going to detract from the diagnostic utility of that image, right? Cutting off part of the scan range, missing the lung, that's not good, right? You might miss part of the, the lung that might have an issue. Uh, lowering your MAS or not allowing the AEC algorithm to pick higher KV stations, I mean, these things are all detrimental to that image quality. If the patient needs the CT, you should give the patient the CT. So now we're gonna talk though about comparing, uh, cause this comes up a lot, right? Getting a CT versus, um, alternatives to uh, CT in the, for the indication of pulmonary embolism. So this was a nice review paper uh, that I like where they talk about the pros and cons here. And one of the things the authors mentioned was that the higher breast radiation exposure with CTPA, CTP protocol, you know, partly explains the recommendation of this um, inhaling radioactive gas type study, VQ lung scans um, versus CT. But I think the authors also say, right, moreover, the radiation doses associated with CTPA and the VQ lung scanning are all well below the safety threshold. You know, so if we start looking at this, the CTPA and the VQ scans, the maternal uh, effective dose, you know, can range uh, pretty greatly depending on the acquisition protocol, patient size, et cetera, but not that high. And the fetal dose is actually lower for CTPA than it is for the radioactive study. So, it's, it's, it's really a, a, a lot lower. And if we look at what uh, a survey of, um, not, not a survey, sorry, a table of the different dose thresholds for a tissue effects or other types of issues we might have with the fetus, and we compare these doses that I just showed here with these fetal doses, we're way lower than any of the thresholds that we're worrying about for that fetus. Like we'd have to give hundreds of those scans to approach some of these thresholds that have scientific evidence. I kind of think of this as, it's like, if you've got a little lake and you want to make a big wave, you got to throw a boulder in there. And everyone agrees, boulder, you get a big wave, right? And now we're going to throw little pebbles in. And in our field, we're doing all this research to talk about the difference in the waves made by like a little bigger pebble or a little littler pebble. We're kind of losing sight of the fact here that these are little pebbles and we need a boulder to do something bad. But there's plenty of papers out there that talk about the X 100% dose reduction they get for this organ or that in the setting of PE uh, for pregnant patient population. But at the end of the day, we're still way lower than any known uh, thresholds that we're actually gonna cause harm to that fetus. So anyway, just keeping that in mind, right? So this is a slide I made. I put this on Twitter in the past and I use it. Uh, it's just kind of like a one, one slide uh, to explain 
what you really shouldn't uh, be afraid of or should be doing you know, to do a proper CTPA protocol. So doing any of these things here is going to limit the diagnostic utility or limit the robustness of the protocol. So we, I don't think you should do this, right? We shouldn't be changing our scan coverage to not include lung bases. We shouldn't try to lower the MAS. We shouldn't skip a timing bolus run, right? PE is one of the hardest things to time. So if, if your shop uses timing bolus, right? A lot, some do. Why would you skip that on this patient and maybe make miss the timing bolus? And then what, are you going to redo the PE? Um, don't put the lead shielding on uh, unless you have to by law, right? There's lots of issues you're going to have with lead shielding in the clinic, right? If you put it on, if you're forced to put it on, I'd say for like some regulatory purpose, I'd put it far away from the lung bases. Pregnant patient is... Is, is really hard to keep that lead shield on and keep it from slipping down into the area where you need a diagnostic image made. Um, yeah, and don't have them drink uh, barium. Why waste the time? The Some people talk about this barium shielding effect, um, right? In this setting, you wanna get the clinical answer as quick as possible, right? That's one of the advantages of not doing a VQ study or doing an MRI study. CT is quite fast. So why would we want to administer, you know, this barium drink that's questionably helping uh, shield the uh, fetus? And we got to wait for that patient to uh, drink that. Um, yeah. So I think uh, the image up in the upper right there is from a real image uh, from our clinic where we had um, a lead apron on that slipped down and blows away the image quality, obviously, because you got lead there in the scan range. Uh, here are just some more examples of that about how you can see on the scout and then if that lead apron can shift during the scan uh, the bad image quality you can see resulting all right so i wanted to just make a quick note on where this shielding stuff comes from right this is a legacy practice right this was u.s law decades ago when we thought x-rays caused hereditary risks right i stopped trying to you know argue with the dent when i go to the dentist's office that i don't want that you know, dirty lead apron put on because it's it's too complicated and they're doing their job. And it's really not at the end of the day that big of a deal, but it's really not doing uh, much of anything. And the use of this is really from science. We were doing our best back then in the 70s, but it, it really didn't make sense now. Um, so for CT, these are definitely something that we want to avoid. All right, what about head scanning in pregnancy though in fetal dose, right? So I tried to make it clear here, like, so when we're scanning a head, right, what, what should we do about um, shielding the patient or giving that patient a lead apron? So I did a little back at the end of the calculations here to say, if we were doing various different types of scanning, including the head, how many of those repeated scans would we need to hit any of these dose thresholds we know for a fetus, like a 50 or 100 milligray threshold? Okay, so I'm doing this for two reasons. Like one, clearly I don't support like lowering doses for uh, PE protocol. But two, like there are cases where we can deliver doses that we should start to be worried about for the fetus. So I want to be clear, like there are some of those cases. And those cases would be when we're doing abdomen, pelvis, pelvis imaging, that is multi-phase imaging directly over where that fetus is. We can hit those thresholds. So you can see here, this is the number of scans needed for median doses for this type of a scan uh, to get us at these different thresholds. So if we were to do uh, abdomen pelvis or pelvis scan, and we needed to do a few different repeats, we could hit those limits. So there is a legit concern here that if you did have a, a, a pregnant uh, patient that did need some kind of multi-phase imaging, you should be you know, uh, paying some extra attention to that to make sure it's appropriate. And as a technologist listening, making sure that um, we're trying really hard to make sure we're not messing anything up so we don't have to do a repeat scan. But outside of that body region, we'd have to deliver a lot of scans because there's really no primary direct radiation from the from the CT scanner hitting that fetus. So here's this kind of a cartoon I made to uh, show that. You got a head scan. All the primary beams are up in the head and the fetus is really just going to get tube leakage. That's this first uh, like error here. They're going to get scattered from within inside the patient that can travel. Um, it's going to be attenuated a lot every few centimeters, but it still can travel and contribute. And then you'll get like scatter from the detector and other parts of the CT scanner. But yeah, a lot of the scanner is, scatter inside is going to be attenuated by the patient. Um, and all these other sources of scatter 
we're not measuring them anymore in terms of milligray. We're basically quantifying them in terms of microgray. So that's like a millionth of uh, a gray or another factor of a thousand times smaller than what the primary beam is uh, here that the patient's getting. All right. So some other issues that you might have with lead here, uh, if lead's used over the torso during a head scan, it may uh, interfere with bolus tracking, right? So you're doing a head scan, maybe a head CTA or something, but if you're doing a bolus tracking run down on the abdomen or, ch or chest rather, um, and you forget like, oh, like I just put lead all over that patient, that bolus tracking might not work, right? Um, it, it takes extra time to place, right? So if you're in the emergent setting for a patient and you've got to, you know, place all this lead, like that's just wasting extra time worrying about if the lead is going to shift off, right? The lead is heavy. Patient can be slippery when they're, you know, you put that over their uh, clothes or blanket, that thing can slip off. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, like I said, that once, if it does slide on the patient and then shifts into a region where imaging, obviously we're going to have image quality issues there. All right. So perfect. We still, we have time to, um, Go over some questions before we introduce uh, the next talk of this session. So yeah, with that, I thank everyone for your attention. I think uh, last week I had these the, this deck in yesterday, and then my my next talks in, in in the share, but I updated them like yesterday, so those new slides should be in there for you all pretty soon. But let's stop share and the Q and A. If anyone has any questions. Um, we can address those now. Oh, I see. Okay, sorry. I was I, I did see one question. Okay, so a few years ago, my department found out on the day that a health uh, ticker was supposed to go live that it was going to include some of effective dose for each patient. Fortunately, our radiologist got that removed before it was implemented. Yeah, I think that's that's a good thing. Not until we have clear guidance on what we would do with that number. Um, you know, should we have tickers like that going out to people, especially if it's gonna be visible outside radiology where um, we have enough problems inside radiology, understanding dose if it's going out to other other physicians and folks in the, in the healthcare system. Uh, I think that could be a recipe for some, some issues. I'd really like to see better dose alarms like this for patients that might ping pong around getting interventional procedures. That could be one area where we did mention that in that AAPM policy report. And that's one thing that, that does cause me worry as a medical physics involved with radiation safety at my institution. Like with a C-arm, you can literally burn you know a hole in a patient, right? And they might be getting uh, hours and hours of cath -like time or other types of interventional procedures. So that that's an area where I think as a community, we, we should we should have some better uh, peak skin dose alarms and tracking over time. Any other questions? Oh, Alex asks, is there any other book publication from my end other than the one in 220? No, that's the only one that took enough effort. No, no other one, Alex thinks. If you can't find that, let me know and I can uh, hook you up or point you to the article that I'm writing about or the research on any particular topic, I'd be happy to do that. I'm not trying to sell anything here. Uh, another question, how do you deal with the confusion of people mixing CTDI vol and DLP? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think I, I, most of the ideal with people confusing CTDI of all and MA, to be honest, um, they see MA values that are really low or really high, and then they get upset. A lot of times it's when MA values are low, and then the images aren't that good, and then they get like, you know, upset about it, even though the CTDI of all could be high, because you might be using like a lower pitch or something like that. But um, I think if people, if folks are really confusing CTDI of all and DLP, my advice would be, if you really would care about image quality, forget the DLP and use the CT devil because the CT devil is where it's at for uh, being a metric that's somewhat re more related to image quality. So that'd be my advice there. So if people confuse that, say you care about image quality, just think about CT devil. 
if the person is really concerned about like how much total dose the patient got uh, for some reason, then then I would be talking about the DLP because that's going to take into account total radiation absorbed inside that patient. And that's not so much going to be related to the total image quality because like, for example, if I just scanned a little longer range at the same level of image quality, the DLP goes up. But that means the image quality could have been the exact same, right? If I've got three series image or three, three uh, image time points and each one's pretty crappy looking, it's really like lower dose, but it, so it's really noisy. My DLP could be high because I have a large scanned volume. I've got three times the volume. So the DLP number could be high, but the image quality could be low. So because of those kinds of considerations, yeah, if you're worried about image quality, CTD eyeballs, definitely where it's at. Yeah. And then I think the last question I'll, I'll make a comment on before we'll all introduce the next speaker is, yeah, I totally agree with this. Yeah. No effort to collect CED and develop guidelines on CED thresholds does not mean forget multiple CT scans and CED forever. Yeah. I'm not saying that. I think, um, sorry, if I came off, I'm, I'm coming off very strong that I, I'm afraid for it clinically. So, um, but that doesn't mean like, I don't uh, think that it's not a valid idea and concept. It just needs more work to be implemented safely in the clinic. Um, the more data we can collect on it today it helps um, down the road when we actually want to have scientific answers to how to use it in the future. So yeah, definitely don't want to forget it.